Um, it's hard to say where to begin a discussion of the commune uh, or a book on the commune. Let me just start it in an unusual place rather than the guns of Montmartre. Uh, in early April, when the government of France had long since removed out of the, out of the capital and was actually resettling in Versailles in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, uh, it was really unclear what the relationship of that government was going to be to the new uh, local commune government that was being declared in Paris. And the, the position of the commune was that they actually wanted to become, they wanted to be part of the government of France. They were not like seceding from France, right? So they sent, uh, they went out, 27,000 of them were wending their way out of Paris at the start of April. Uh, out to the west of Paris, where the Seine kind of swings to the north from there, uh, through Neul to uh, uh, the area that's now part of La Défense, um, west of the city. And if you go out there now, you can still see the the, the fort at uh, Mont Valerian off to the left. High ground, something that the Germans never really occupied uh, during the earlier siege, but was then occupied by the French army. And as this large number of people were leaving Paris, they had been assured by people who were in the army that they were not going to be fired on. It's not as though there was a war existed between the government of France and the, and the people of Paris. Um, and this column, as it's leaving the city, the population is uh, hungry, stressed out, it's been blocked up in the city for weeks. Peace has been declared, but they hadn't really had much of a chance to get out. So there was almost a picnic kind of an atmosphere. Civilians were accompanying the column, feeling security uh, that they had these uh, armed members of the National Guard around them. And contemporaries describe it as almost a kind of a picnic atmosphere. You know, people were out there buying fresh produce. When they got to these villages outside the city, they, they were opening wine, they were picnicking in the grass, kids were playing along the river. They felt very secure. If you might compare what they were thinking at the time, I think, to the women in the first French Revolution that, that went out to bring the king back from Versailles um, to return him to the capital. And that's sort of what most of the people were thinking when they left Paris. It was not as described as a military operation. Uh, Lord knows, I think if you had that kind of a force and you were going out and you knew that there was actually an army out there, um, you probably wouldn't have done that. What happened was that uh, they got to a certain point and the artillery opened from uh, Valerian, and it uh, drove them back into the city. When those uh, shells exploded, it wasn't just the National Guardsmen and the civilians and the picnickers that were being exploded, but they were exploding a number of concepts that had been central to 19th century radicalism. Up to this point, begun to fade a little earlier, but up to this point, one of those is the notion of national community, um, that nationalism was going to be a way out of the impasse, that coming out of the French Revolution, uh, you have people like uh, Giuseppe Mazzini talking about nations as sort of extended communities, families, if you will. And they're only as strong, only as prosperous as the poorest, as the weakest, um, that nations look out for its members. This kind of approach was very common among the, the writers of nationalism up to a point. They also believed, as part of that, that the new society would be secularist. By that, I don't mean it would necessarily be anti-clerical or anything or anti-church, but its fundamental structuring of society would be done along the lines of reason. Uh, people believed that if you make a reasonable argument, this is an age where you have widespread literacy now, um, newspapers, people, ordinary people reading newspapers, that was a general sense if you make a rational argument 
that you're going to wind up swaying people to your position. You can think in the United States, for example, about the abolitionist movement, which was, you know, is rightly touted as a, a, a great positive force in American life. True. But when they started, they believed that they were engaged in a sort of religious campaign of moral suasion. They believed that if they could convince the slaveholders that slavery was not moral, it was not rational, it was not economic, that the slaveholders would abandon the institution. Um, this had happened in some parts of the uh, United States to the north in the aftermath of the American Revolution. It did not happen in the South, and it wouldn't happen in the South. Um, you would have individual slaveholders that might abandon slavery, manumit their slaves, but it was never going to change the institution. And even if you get rid of the institution in places in the lower South, they'll just sell the slaves on South. It doesn't change anything about their enslavement. But that was a faith, a belief that sweet reason would prevail. And indeed, this is what we find the, the argument, uh, even in our own day, that if we make a rational argument, that the rationality will prevail, that people will see reason. And I think uh, we don't so much today, but in the 19th century, this was a very common belief. You find the early critics of capitalism. This is true whether we're dealing with Proudhon or we're dealing with the Fourierist, or even to some extent when we're dealing with Marx in his, in his uh, early writings. There's a sense that if you make the case clearly enough, it will prevail on its own merits. And that's not how merits are determined in capitalism. So there's nationalism, there's the idea of secular reason, and there's also the idea that the political manifestation of these things would be the republic. Now there's a nice vague term for us, isn't it? But the idea that you're gonna have a representative system of government in a society where the majority of people are excluded from government. And you're saying that if effectively that uh, um, the reason that these people are uh, deprived of their rights is partly because they're deprived of their power. So the notion that you're going to establish a, rep a genuinely representative system of government, a republic, is implicit in that, the idea that that working class majority winds up dominating. Um, it also has tremendous implications in terms of race, implications in terms of gender. Um, people tend to forget that uh, it was very, it was actually a rather commonplace notion. These, uh, uh, it was not uh, simply when we're talking about the question of slavery, you also talk more about that in terms of racial equality. Uh, you also have the women's rights movement starting in this place, not just here, but in any number of countries. Uh, and that was a general sense that when you have this great transformation that's going to, that's on the verge of taking place in the middle of the 19th century, that it's going to change all of that. It is really going to be transformative. This process of actually trying to do this, I'd say you can, you can have roots in the 18th century. But it really begins for us in the middle of the 19th century, those uh, peoples of 1849. And the process comes to an end, I would say, the um, Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71 and the subsequent commune uprising in Paris. This is um, what we find is that nationalism is not the salvation of the peoples. Nationalism as a grand uh, extended family of some sort. But it uh, basically simply means the, the subjugation of a population to an organized state power uh, backed by the military. Um, the balance on the power in the continent at the end of this process is going to be shifting to a new German empire, right? Not a republic, but an empire. Not that the word is that important on one level. If we think about this whole question of republicanism, France, in the course of the Franco-Prussian War, the, the Germans are so successful militarily. It was one of the, it was a modern conflict in many respects. The Germans moved so quickly that they managed to simply disintegrate 
the imperial forces of France in a matter of weeks in the late summer, leading to the surrender of the imperial forces at Sedan in early September of 1870. And that's it for Napoleon III. The Second Empire is dead. So now you're going to get what will become the Third Republic starts to come to power. It's the Third Republic, not an empire. And yet the people who wind up running it, for the most part, are not just going to be the few scattered Republicans who were in government before the fall of the empire, uh, Gambetta and those folks, but you're going to have old monarchists who basically wind up taking power in the Republic. I don't think anybody saw that coming. Um, nevertheless, it's in hindsight, it was almost inevitable that that would happen. You want to have, you're going to establish a new government. You look around who has experience governing. And the monarchists are quite willing to volunteer in that project, right? And it's a disaster. From this point on, from, from the War of 70-71 and from the Paris Commune on, we don't talk about republicanism quite the same way as we did before. If you think about republicanism in any of these uh, Western countries, it's, um, it is, as I was sort of describing it before, almost a utopian vision of what's going to happen when you eliminate the power of the monarchies and the aristocracies and you have a truly representative system of government. It doesn't turn out that way at all. Um, in the case of republican government in, uh, in France, it's basically the monarchists coming to power under a different label. Certainly in the United States in the same period, we have, we have the Republican Party starts as a third party movement. People forget that. Um, it took its name. The person who named it was a man named Alvin Bovet, who was um, a teacher in New York, who moved out to Wisconsin to live as a member of the Wisconsin Phalanx, the Fourierist community at Soresco which, because that name was taken by another post office, when they got a post office, they had to adopt the name of Ripon, Wisconsin. If you remember Ripon, Wisconsin, that's where the Republican Party claims its origins. The meetings that founded the Republican Party there were about half of women. Well, what do you expect from a socialist community, right? Beauvais himself was the national secretary of the um, People described in the Communist Manifesto as the agrarian reformers, the national reformers in the United States. In other words, Marx and Engels were seeing that as, as co-thinkers um, in the United States. But that's the kind of republicanism you're talking about uh, when you're going back to that period. By the time we get to the end here, the whole meaning of republicanism has changed. After 1871, People who ho hold those kinds of ideas are not as likely to describe themselves as Republicans in the, in the future. They will call themselves socialists. They will call themselves anarchists. They will call themselves communists. They will call themselves revolutionaries or just radicals. They will, they will call themselves by all sorts of things other than Republican. Because in, the idea of Republicanism as it pans out in the middle of the 19th century is not that different than what they were trying to overthrow. All right. Um, I would take another good example of that. Um, at the same time, we can talk about what Republicanism had come to mean in terms of the government of France or what it meant um, in Italy. You get the unification of the country. What else do you get? You get a constitutional monarchy. The U.S. ambassador to France during the period of the war in the commune was a man named uh, uh, Washburn. Ambassador Washburn was an old style Midwestern abolitionist. He was a militant advocate of the early Republican party. By the time we get to the Franco-Prussian war, that kind of Republicanism is now having to make choices. Do you want the kind of Republicanism you used to talk about? Um, or is it nationalism, which is going to be important? Well, what was important to Washburn, what was important to those Americans who were over there in many cases, was the unity of the United States coming out of the Civil War. And the sympathies of the Americans for the Germans was almost undisguised. Germany was, was waging this war against France as an attempt to consolidate its own unity as a nation. 
And American officials who were over there were overwhelmingly sympathetic to the Germans, including Washburn. And he was as absolutely nasty, slanderous, and libelous of the commune when it came along as any aristocrat. So again, that notion of what republicanism was, even on an institutional, in an institutional way, has changed what the meaning would be. Um, one of the things that got me interested in this, and this is probably worth a, a, a noting, as a side note, was um, I've always been interested in the history of radicalism in the United States, and particularly the role of emigres coming over here. And in my other work, I talk about a Scottish radical named Hugh Forbes and um, Gustav Clusere, who is a trained officer in the French army, who winds up a general in the Union Army in the Civil War. And both of these guys wind up putting together what will later become the International Working Men's Association in the United States. Roots, uh, roots are with those. Um, interestingly enough, the organization, uh, the coalition of uh, emigre radicals and Americans in the 1850s referred to themselves as the Universal Democratic Republicans, right? After the commune, they would not do that again. And that was fairly, uh, fairly common. What, what's interesting about both Forbes and Clusere was that both of them actually fought with Garibaldi. When Giuseppe Garibaldi uh, returned from Latin America to participate in the revolution of 1848-49, he was, of course, an ardent nationalist, is a, a vital figure in terms of uh, uh, the unification of Italy. But more than that, he articulated the idea very explicitly that nationalism by definition, if nations, if Republican governments come to power on a national basis and they respect the Republican nature of their neighboring states, this will be an end to war. Nationalism, in other words, implied an in internationalism. And when Garibaldi was organizing his revolutionary forces in Europe, he um, organized international legions, as they called them. So you would have a French legion with Clusere in it. You would have a English legion, actually two of them. Forbes would be in one of those. Um, you had German legions, uh, including people who were close to the Communist League that were fighting in Italy in uh, 48, 49, and again in 1860, when all of that starts up again. So that idea, that kind of nationalism, just like the older ideas of uh, republicanism, gets exploded in the War of 1870-71. Uh, Garibaldi, when the war breaks out, the Franco, let me explain a little bit about the Franco-Prussian War, how it starts. Basically, Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, the, the uh, minister in Prussia, um, realized that after a war with uh, Denmark and a war with Austria, that he had successfully welded together a German confederation around the power of the Prussian state. And what he needed to pull all of that together was another war with a common enemy, France being the most obvious. So he, he there had, there's a dynastic dispute in Spain. There's a diplomatic tiff over it. And Bismarck gets control of writing the official German, the official Prussian cable in response to it, which is um, rather insulting to the French government. He know, knew which put, buttons to push. And he doesn't release it until Bastille Day. So as soon as that hits, uh, hits France, there is a clamor, especially among the military elites and so on, to go to war with Prussia because, well, I was going to make a snarky comment about nations being stupid enough in those days to go to war for national honor, but that king seems kind of stupid and redundant nowadays against the background of what we're seeing, right? Um, honor is always something, a universal fuel on this. But he basically suckered the French into declaring war on him. And as a result, most of the Republican sentiment around the world is on the side of Germany, at least up until the Second Empire falls. When the Second Empire falls and they organize a new government, which they're going to call a republic, at that point, Garibaldi, who has earlier supported the Germans, verbally, 
then declares it a duty of all Republicans in Europe and the world to stand behind Republican France. And he goes to France himself, although he's an old man, hobbling at this point. He's got a bad war wound in his foot and he has terrible arthritis. But he offers his sword to the French government, um, which is a mixed blessing for those people. They can't refuse it, really, but they really don't want it, don't want him there. And what happens in, uh, in that case, and what interested me in the subject originally, was that Garibaldi goes off and he is basically, they, they sort of put him in a corner on his own, saying, you go organize your own army. And what happens is that you get legions coming in from Italy and Spain and, and 400 Germans that uh, cross over to fight against the uh, German Confederation uh, on behalf of the French Republic. That's the old kind of republicanism. And in some ways, they are sort of the last Republicans, because nobody is going to be talking about Republicanism after this point. There are elements of um, those international legions that are carrying, that are wearing badges of the first international and are card carrying members of the international. Um, there is an ambulance corps that's raised in Switzerland by the international to assist that portion of the French army. But that kind of tells you why there might be some problem with this whole thing, with this whole arrangement, doesn't it? Um, once the imperial armies are crushed, the, this new French government has to sort of rebuild its military force, and it's done in a very decentralized way. They also face a real problem. Um, they don't want Paris to be part of the country in terms of, of the National Assembly. So one of the obvious military goals you would have to have is the retaking of Paris. One of the political goals of this French government is keep Paris out of it. As long as Paris is surrounded by the Germans, they're not going to be sending noisy delegates to the National Assembly, uh, raising all sorts of issues that they don't want discussed there. So there's all of the tensions that go on. Um, that are redefining nationalism, what what reason, what happens to secular reason during all of this, right? Uh, secular reason, the restoration of uh, the French government, even calling itself a republic, even though there are a lot of monarchists in charge of that government, they also reestablish their alliance in order to rebuild their army with the church. So the... People of Paris always were more cosmopolitan than the uh, uh, rest of the country in terms of their approach to the church. Not as though the church was a popular institution, but in rural areas, it understandably remained the dominant force. So um, you now have a national republic that is in alliance with the church and whose idea of rebuilding its military strength is calling in all these imperial generals and rebuilding an imperial army as an arm of the republic. Um, they are going to put in charge of this armed force that they are building in response to the entreaties of the people of Paris to be part of the national government um, is going to be uh, Macmillan, uh, Patrice Macmillan. He's, he's, he's a descendant of an, an Irish um, soldier who had fought in Napoleon's forces. He was the general commanding the defeated forces at Sedan. Um, so he's not been very successful against shooting Germans. But boy, is he going to be successful in organizing the shooting of the uh, French. What happens in, within the commune is worth talking a little bit about that. The commune is going to hit face first all of the problems you would imagine if suddenly you have the institutions of, of authority and power disintegrate. And this is, I think, one of the lessons about revolution that comes out of this particular subject. Revolution is not going to happen because of our, our, our articulate uh, posing of questions to our fellow citizens. I don't know how many arguments over the years I've had with people who would, the argument would end and they'd say, you're absolutely right. You know, socialism makes complete sense but it isn't going to change anything in terms of what they do. It becomes sort of an intellectual preference or something, I guess. Um, but in terms of actually moving people, 
it's got to be something that they experience. So months of siege under the Germans um, and the hostility of their own government is an experience that people in Paris just can't avoid. The government they're putting together intends, intended to be, the commune intended to be nothing more than a democratic local government um, where they would take over the administration of their own communities, right? Now, what happens if you have a population that really doesn't vote, that has no experience in evaluating issues or hearing issues or discussing issues or, or um, making democratic decisions? Their only experience is about, about that long just since the collapse of the German siege um, and the confrontation over the guns at Montmartre in uh, mid-March. So a couple of weeks, and then you're going to have an election. So who do you think is going to win an election under those circumstances? Um, the election is going to be based on name recognition, right? Personalities, I wouldn't say celebrities. But you're going to be electing a lot of journalists and agitators. Don't get me wrong. I very much respect journalists and I love agitators. But they may not be the best people to govern a city. Right. And they certainly prove that um, when they take when they wind up in charge of the commune, they um, engage in a lot more infighting than they do fighting with the government or organizing response to the government. There are several real ideological problems that are holdovers from those old utopian ideas about nationality and reason. Um, one of which is the, when they come up with this absolutely suicidal idea that the way the city can defend itself best is not by some centralized force, but neighborhood by neighborhood, people fighting to defend their own houses, right? Yeah, it sounds good. But of course, it just is an invitation for the French government to come in and conquer those areas piecemeal. Um, there are a lot of problems with this. And the problems is, are those that are going to, that we're going to come up against in any revolutionary situation. Uh, the um, military defense of the city, the nuts and bolts of the military defense of the city, are a nightmare. Um, I would say that they make a lot of major mistakes, but that would kind of exaggerate their grasp of what they needed to do. They had some very good people. One of the things I write about a lot in the book is that a lot of these good people they had are people who are veterans of Garibaldi's earlier efforts. In order to make a revolution in the end, uh, you're going to have to have people who know how to function in a military situation. And you have a lot of veterans of Garibaldi's armies and Garibaldi's earlier efforts turning up in Paris. Those members of the Army of the Vosges who were fighting with Garibaldi um, out on the eastern end of France wind up after the truce coming back into the city of Paris. And they are there and they take over a major role in the entire thing. Um, we are mistaken if we think about the Paris Commune as primarily a Marxist kind of thing. It isn't quite tra made that transition yet, but it's certainly a Garibaldian thing, right? Uh, all through the accounts of the commune, you read of uh, uh, local officers popping up wearing their characteristic red shirts and uh, organizing those communities, organizing the defense. The list of people who wind up ministers of war of the commune, and this is a great political game. Uh, Closere winds up sort of the first minister of war of the commune. His first goal, once he looks at the situation, is to figure out how he can avoid a bloodbath. He was a French army officer himself in his younger days, and he had no doubts whatsoever what the intentions of the government were going to be. So um, he opens negotiations with the government won't talk to him, but the Germans do. So he opens negotiations with anybody who will talk to him. His idea is pleading to the world community, such as it was at the time, to avoid the massacre of the population. But he finds that in defending the city, when the government forces start moving on it, 
Uh, he cannot get recruits in one neighborhood to go out to a fort in another neighborhood, even though that's sort of the main way that the government forces are going to get into Paris, right? It's just sort of ABC kind of mistakes that are made. And part of it has to do with a religion of decentralization that cripples the commune. And part of that is the fact that the members of the commune are often engaged more in infighting with each other than with actually cooperating to uh, protect the city. Well, we could go on talking about the, the bits and pieces of this for some time. Let's just say that in this transition period we're talking about between 1848-49 and the Franco-Prussian War in the Commune, utopianism yields to practicality. Uh, when we think of Marxism as scientific socialism as opposed to its predecessors, that's probably a great exaggeration in some respects, but it also has a real element of truth to it when we look at this. Uh, Marxism has an understanding of what is going on here. Today, when I hear people talk, I hear students talk about it a lot, describing themselves as socialist, right? And it's always interesting to me. Um, I, my first reaction is, where the hell have you been for 50 years? <laughs> you know, but... If you think about this, uh, what they're talking about are changes that have to do with issues, often rhetoric about issues. And I'm not saying that these are bad issues. They're great issues. Society would be much better if we adopted uh, universal health care. It would be much better if they just simply waived student loan, if they made education free. And it'd be great. It'd be great under any kind of society, right? But... What the commune continues to remind us, the experience of the commune, is that it's not about rhetoric and it's not even about issues. The reason that we talk about these issues at all is because a society that actually represents the working class majority would naturally do these sorts of things. It would just make sense for them to do it, whatever they're going to call it. It's, it's in their self-interest to do it. Um, the problem is that we are forgetting the fundamental lesson that socialism is about power. And what, what happened with the commune, the shortcomings of the commune, what would have resolved the shortcomings of the commune was having a longer run at it than a couple of weeks. Um, the movement as a school for democracy it's a school for figuring out how we govern ourselves. It's a school for figuring out how we can govern ourselves without leaders, without, without leaders in the sense of celebrities, right? The people who have the, have the loudest voices necessarily prevail. Um, it takes time to do that. It takes building movements to get to that point. Um, we certainly have no sense that that's an under, a widespread understanding today. I keep thinking about the uh, inauguration of Donald Trump when you had these these mass marches that took place um, that greeted his ascension to the throne. And it was um, really gratifying to see all those people out in the streets. And then I saw how the uh, uh, groups like Move On were basically taking control of the steering committees. They were the ones who were going to decide whether people could call that again. And when an issue came up, like the uh, uh, hearings for the uh, uh, confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, uh, I just kept thinking as they were going on, what, ha what would happen if to respond to that, you had one or two million women and their allies in the streets protesting that? It would have been a very, very different outcome indeed. But rather than to win, relying on the people, Politicians prefer to lose and not owe the people anything for coming out and supporting their position. So it's a very interesting problem that we're at, very interesting uh, point in our history. We need, I think, to remember, especially uh, Marxist, that the question is going to be one of power. And power, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, our ability to organize a military defense of Paris, but I'm talking about um, our ability to be able to uh, make democratic decisions, learn how to make democratic decisions. Um, 
So I would say that um, the people of different nations in the end, this is one of the things I find found interesting about the commune. And I wanted to write this book partly because of that. I wanted to talk about the, the importance of that question of power, the importance of the soldiery in, uh, in the history of the commune, which often I think we miss. Um, but I also wanted to talk about the way that the commune mobilized uh, a world historic event. We tend to think about the people of Paris. It was the people of Paris. But the people of Paris were not simply French. The people of Paris, a cosmopolitan location like that, were from all over. There's a report by the army after they come in and they crush the commune. And they slaughter 20,000 people uh, for the crime of being in the city. Um, and they round up some as prisoners. And they actually do an enumeration of the citizens of different parts, different countries um, that have now fallen into the hands of the French army. And they are quite literally from all over the place. Um, you would expect that there's going to be a large number of Spanish and Belgian and, uh, and Italians, and they certainly are. There are also a good chunk of Germans. There are Americans. There are um, people from Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, I should say. Uh, because they distinguish between people from North Africa and just Africa, right? Uh, people of color were very vital and, and a part of the Paris Commune. Um, you have units in the in the French army during the war who are defining themselves as Montevideans, right? There's a Latin American presence in the commune. Um, the people who had ex gone through the experience of the war in the commune will rise up again in 1873 and 74 in Spain. There will be a wave of bread riots across Italy in which people who were veterans of the war in the commune um, play a prominent role. In fact, in 1871, at the end of the year, the uh, newspapers in Chicago announced that the Petrolos, the terrifying mythical women who were running around uh, Paris setting fires, that they were responsible for the great fire that destroyed Chicago in 1871, right? Um, invisible gremlins, the Illuminati, they're all over the place. I would say, though, in closing, that uh, you not only have this as a world historic uh, event, in the sense that people from the world participated in it, people from different nations manned the barricades. And I say, man, to make a point, <laughs> because women played a major role in the war, and they played a major role in the commune. There was one barricade um, north of the city, in the northern part of the city, that was said to have been entirely uh, women on that barricade, uh, arms in hand, defending their neighborhood. Something like 85 women on that barricade. That's, that's phenomenal. It goes beyond some sort of a Joan of Arc tradition, and it sort of somewhat anticipates a role for uh, gorillas in, the, in, the, uh, in our own day. Anyway, I would close it just with this idea, um, that question of power and the importance of power is a central thing in, uh, in radical, the radical critique and the radical prospects uh, for change in the country and the world. And that... Um, Deny it as we would like to be. The fact is that we are all children of the commune. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we can open for uh, Q and A uh, discussion, comments, uh, what you will. Uh, if you want to uh, speak, you can use the uh, the Zoom feature of uh, raising your hand, or you can type the word stack in the chat box and we will add you to the stack. So floor is open. Well, Mark, I have a question uh, and it has to do with uh, some of the advanced publicity for this uh, event that we promised. Uh, just kind of quoting it, uh, Mark Laws analyzes changes in European warfare in the closing decades of the 19th century. Uh, the war introduced new military technologies, transformed the organization of armies, and upset the continental balance of power. The mass armies that became a new standard required mass mobilizations of working people who exercised a new power 
et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder if you could just maybe elaborate a little more on that particular point of the uh, changes in in the military dimension of society, in addition to the the three uh, things that you uh, put up front in, in your in your presentation. Sure. I mean, in a sense, that is the question of uh, nationalism going from an ideal, a kind of a utopian uh, Mazzini's notion that, of, of an extended family, a community, uh, an extended community, to uh, the reality, which is that nations are going to represent, are going to be states backed by military strength. Uh, we talk about mass armies having experience with them in the Napoleonic era, but in this period, the mid 19th century, they become endemic. Um, the, the military experience is something that basically draws in anyone who is unfortunate enough to get caught in the net. Um, it's the kind of armies that go into the field in on behalf of Germany, are armies that are sort of trained to this. Uh, the military service on the German side, uh, people had been used to it, even without war. Uh, you would basically go in, do your time, and you would have a certain number of years where you would still be actually in the army, although you weren't necessarily uh, having to live with it. Then there was a long period of like 10 years where you would get called back periodically and trained. The Germans were so well prepared for this. The French rely very heavily um, on uh, what kind of, I say, smoke and mirrors. They still need large numbers of people, but we have to remember that the French went into this really suicidal experience of the Franco-Prussian War very confident. And I don't know where that confidence actually comes from. They had just been defeated in Mexico, right? They had been fighting in North Africa on and off for a long time, never really sort of subjugated the population there to where they felt uh, secure in it. Uh, they were fighting Indo in Indochina, right? At the same time the U.S. is fighting a civil war, the French are making sure that we'll have something to fight in the 1960s here, right? The French are going into Indochina. The French and the British are also messing around in the war in China, the Taiping Rebellion. Um, it's a global military force. And as such, when they mobilize for this war, they're tapping into people in those colonies. So one of the, one of the things I thought was very fascinating when I was doing work on this, I, I kind of covered the basics of the Franco-Prussian War. There's some things I sort of elaborated on a little more. Um, and that is the reliance on those, what they would call Turcos, the Africans, they're not Turks, they're North Africans for the most part. And this also includes a sizable chunk of black Africans. We know that France got rid of slavery in 1848, but they were in control in North Africa from 1830 on. So um, when the French got control of the place, they also cultivated slavery. So you had thousands of blacks who were captured and taken into North Africa to serve as slaves. And there's not much of a future for them, um, except by joining the army. So that you have, you have clear evidence that the French army includes um, five regiments of Turcos and that there are black soldiers fighting in that, right? And they are a absolute mystery to the Germans, who of course don't have an empire. If you want to, if you want to, put somebody exotic in front of the Germans, find somebody from Switzerland, right? But um, the kind of weapons that they're using are, they, they sort of approach this thing in a nice Napoleonic way. And it is just terrible. The, the Germans have a new weapon, uh, the Dreda, which is a needle gun. That is, uh, these are not any more muzzle loaders like were used in the American Civil War. They're breech loaders. The French have what's called a chassepot. I actually had a brother-in-law who was uh, a bit of a collector of guns. God knows where he got all these things. But anyway, uh, in the course of going through what he had collected, I picked up a chassepot. I was quite astonished both that it was a chassepot and that I recognized it. Um, this was a remarkable weapon that the French had just put into uh, into the field. But... 
in the same sense, you needed earlier large numbers to fill those sort of closed ranks armies that you've been using since Napoleon's day. Um, they're using them in the field in 7071, and it has the same kind of result as in the American Civil War. Um, the weapons are more accurate. They, they fire further. Um, they, there's no way that you can simply overwhelm them. There are a lot of sort of like charges that take place, and you wonder what these people were thinking when they did it. Uh, you have cavalry. And it's being Europe, you have very strange things happen. It's one of the battles in the Franco-Prussian War. The uh, Germans decide that they're going to take the French artillery position. And they send the cavalry out. And they're out there galloping through this field. And suddenly they're like on pavement. And it's an old Roman road, right? These people are fighting over very old battlefields continually. Um, the French artillery is not as good as the German artillery. These are the guns of Krupp. They fire exploding shells. They fire uh, using chemicals. They um, uh, fire longer, faster. And um, well, the faster is very, a very important thing because you can get 100 of these lined up and you can just blast the other side to pieces. The French have what's called the Mitralus, uh, which is an uh, automatic rifle. That's kind of how they would describe it. If you look at a picture of it, it looks exactly like the American Gatling gun. It's a machine gun, basically. And they don't quite know how to use them. The way that you should use them is you spread them out with your infantry, and they can protect your infantry that way. Their militaries are creatures of habit, so they actually treat them like artillery. So they organize them by batteries. But there, there are blood-curdling descriptions of some of these engagements where the soldiers are hearing the sound of a machine gun firing over them. And um, I keep thinking this is what this is what their grandsons are going to be hearing in uh, 1914. There are places. I think I opened the book talking about the uh, uh, Corps, right, which is uh, in the middle of the battlefield of Stom, right? And this is the site of a battle of the Franco-Prussian War. It's also um, where the Romans drove back the Huns the first time they tried to move into Gaul. Um, and it's actually not a hill. It's a prehistoric burial mound for a local Celtic warlord that had power in the area before the Romans arrived. So this is like 2,000 years, 3,000 years fighting over the same ground. All of that changes in the mid-19th century um, because, well, we might think, is what, what is actually going to be the archaeological prospect of getting into that? Nobody will ever dig into that because there's so, so much unexploded ordnance yet. That, that hill changed hands during the Psalm 17 times, right? The amount of artillery that they're putting in, in the Franco-Prussian War anticipates what will happen in World War I. Um, in 1861, 65, you know, 80% of the casualties inflicted in the, the American war are by rifled muskets. Um, in World War I, it's like 80, 90%, depending on where you're at, are going to be inflicted by long range artillery. Uh, you don't see the people that you're killing or maiming, and they don't see you. Everything is done um, long distance. And a lot of what happens in the Franco-Prussian War anticipates that. You get this very strange mix where it looks very Napoleonic. And at the same time, you, well, you actually have a battle fought at Verdun, right? It very much anticipates what's going to happen down the line. Um, you would think that the, um, well, I'll mention one other technological innovation of the war. When Paris is under siege, um, there's a story about uh, Jules Verne coming back into Paris, even when the commune is going on, trying to find his publisher. And his publisher is basically out of business because the printers are off with the commune, right? But all everything that, that Jules Verne is writing about, you know, about balloons comes from the experience of what he saw in the, uh, in the Franco-Prussian War. 
there are a whole range of balloons that come. They have been out all the capital cities saw uh, experimentation with hot air balloons. When the war comes, when Gambetta decides he's going to flee Paris before it becomes uh, entirely impossible to get out, he gets into a balloon and flees, right? And um, mail, even though the city is besieged, mail is getting out of Paris by balloon. Uh, at one point, they're sitting in a meeting of the First International in London, and they actually get a letter from one of their members who had gone back to Paris to um, uh, to fight. And they hear from him, thanks to the mail that was going out by balloon. The Germans, by the way, had a, um, a balloon cannon in, right? Uh, the, what you could call the first piece of anti-aircraft artillery, um, where they made a special, the Krupps made a nice special gun where you could shoot at a balloon as it was flying overhead. Of course, they weren't going to hit it. They weren't that good. They would get that good later. But the technology, uh, the technology is, uh, I suppose, the, the fundamental change in terms of technology is that the Germans were observers. The Prussians were observers over here during the Civil War. And the one thing they learned was the importance of the railroads. So when you look at a railroad map of France and Germany, when this whole thing starts, the French, well, they encouraged railroads, but they encouraged railroads on a kind of a local and regional level. Uh, in coal mining districts, for example, um, the German industrial districts were over towards the Rhine and the Ruhr. They were over on that end of the country. So you had four or five major rail lines that would take Germans. You can pile them on these cars. And the army took over when the war started, took over the railroads. And they just marched these guys into these boxcars and shuttled them off to the, to the uh, French border. And it took no time to get there. The French army, on the other hand, is actually marching a lot of that distance. There was one account, I couldn't find it when I finished the draft, but I had now encountered it, of um, a French soldier who was so absolutely miserable after the experience that he sat by the side of the road and shot himself in the head rather than to continue with it. So it must have been a pretty rough march for them. Um, it also, I think, um, provides the foundation for the sort of discontent that spread in the French army. Um, there was discontent in both armies. I think I was mentioning a few people who were actually elected social democrats in the, in the German army who wound up uh, participating in the war, not particularly voluntarily. Uh, people, like I said, the, the radicals tended to support Germany until the fall of the Second Empire. And once that happens, once Germany says we want Alsace and Lorraine, we want, uh, uh, you know, uh, reparations for the war reparations. Um, at that point, it becomes a war of conquest. It's a very strange conflict. We might be used to looking at these things and seeing one side as progressive and the other is not as being absolutely reactionary. In this one, it's almost like it flips in the uh, in the middle of the war. So. Hmm. Um, so the railroads, yes. <laughs> Any, okay. Anything particularly you're thinking? Uh, no, that's that's great. Uh, let's go on to Michael. Hey, um, hi, Mark. I, hi. I, I remember when I first read about the commune, for some reason, I found out that there had been communes in Marseille. Lille, oh, yeah. Toulouse. They didn't last long, but compared to, say, the Occupy of 2011, some of those communes lasted longer than the Occupy encampments. And that I, I do wonder, was there a similar type of organization in these towns and was there any coordination? And was it that Marseille, Lyon and Toulouse were crushed by the French military, the German military? Did they have any type of defense? Did they fail to have the women come over and get the many of the soldiers to get the cannons into the the National Guard's um, hands so that there was a, a way to counter the French or the Tier forces and with the Prussians backing them up. Um, I'm, I'm not going to speculate more than that. And I, on another note, but because I see you're answering fairly thoroughly, I want to just go into one other aspect, which is 
from very early on when the reactionary bourgeois forces at Versailles were capturing communards, there was a fairly systemic practice of entertaining with the torture and execution of some of the prisoners. It was quite brutal, as I recall. And, and the communards were incredibly restrained about how they treated the French forces that they captured, including the archbishop they ultimately mm-hmm. got rid of. But your thoughts on what was it? Is it much like the Democrats will complain about the Republicans forever and not and even though they engage in the, the some of the same practice, but uh, will allow their opponents to do incredibly outlandish things and not do much because they, in 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 a sense, are of the same ilk and do not want to have new uh, restrictions put on what they might like to do if they got in power. Uh, but, but your thoughts would be uh, really helpful if you can. Um. The commune makes a decision after the um, the movement on Versailles I was talking about, where they, they open fire on them. The commune basically decides that they're going to take hostages, which is an iffy approach to this uh, anyway. But the real problem is, again, the way the commune decentralized these things. A lot of times you read accounts of the commune and people say things like, well, the commune did this in my neighborhood or that in my neighborhood. It's not the commune. It's you basically licensed um, armed gangs to go out and do things in the name of the revolution, right? And in the case when they finally decide to start shooting the hostages, um, remember, uh, Valin, uh, some of the leaders of the First International are there. Closere is certainly trying to save the life of the archbishop, and it's not particularly because he's a great fan of archbishops, Right. But right. he knows what this means in terms of the long-term legacy of the commune um, and what it means in terms of the international community. Uh, the American ambassador got in to see the archbishop before he was killed, and that was directly due to the uh, intervention of General Closeret. But the idea of um, what was happening, what they were doing to the communards, is we have to kind of balance that on, on one level. Um, one way to think about that is that the... Uh, um, Soldiers who were coming in were basically, again, not really veterans of the war so much. They were sort of raised after the war was over. And you went out into the French countryside and you told these people, oh, that there's a uh, pizzeria in the middle of Paris and they're engaged in child molestation. And they're, you know, um, they basically you could resort to the old um, rural paranoia about people in the big cities. And they also say that Paris, the commune, is not a rising of real French people. It's a rising of foreigners, right? So these people who are coming in, I think a lot of them did not know what they were in for at all. I suspect that much like the Russian soldiers in the Ukraine at this point, um, that they were, they are really coming into an experience that they are not, not in much of a position to prevent or to respond to. So that a lot of the people who were doing this, and there are a number of instances of this, and of course, by the very nature, historical sources are tricky because we're going to get the historical sources that they want us to see, that the people who are going through this are going to want us to know about. And a lot of the stuff that for one reason or another is not necessarily well documented or is recorded, at least not on a scale as it actually happened. There are certainly instances where soldiers, including officers, uh, saved the lives of communards as they were coming into the city. I don't know that they did that much at first, but once they got into the city and they saw the bloodbath that was being, um, that was underway, this is something that soldiers do in general. Uh, you don't, you, nobody like wants to join the army because they want to kill arm, unarmed civilians. Um, so there's actually, there's actually another side to this thing. And we don't know how extensive it was, because as I said, if you do something like this, you're not going to like write a report on it. <laughs> but some people who are sort of saved in that way, um, 
do record their experience later. Um, Closere himself, by the way, who was jailed by the commune because um, they wouldn't let him move troops from one part of the city to the other. And then they jailed him because he was not able to move troops from one end of the city to the other and effectively defend the city. Um, he actually is tried by the commune and uh, manages to win an acquittal from the commune in the middle of all of that. But that by that time, um, the government troops were already in the city and beginning the, uh, the bloody week. And Clusere winds up getting saved by Jesuit priests, oddly enough. And that seems to happen in a number of cases. Um, so there is, there is that side of it. Um, I also think that it's going to be very hard for us to, even now, there was a, I can't remember who it was, one of the sort of like standard historians who's written about this a couple of years ago, wrote a refutation of the idea that the commune was suppressed in blood um, to the extent that people used to talk about it. Uh, he argues that, in fact, there were only maybe 11,000 people killed in the commune and um, the left has sort of exaggerated this to make the crime capitalism bigger, to which my response is <laughs> World War I or World War II, and we have to exaggerate something that happened in 1871 to make the crimes of capitalism bigger. No, absolutely to be certain. It was, it was in the neighborhood of 20,000, if not more. Um, and we don't know how many were killed after it was over. It's sort of like talking about the Spanish Civil War. How many are killed after Franco wins? Um, there are accounts, contemporary accounts, and you read about when they're coming in. Everybody who goes to Paris and, you, you know, the one site for the commune that people go to is in the uh, Père Lachaise, right? So well, the wall of the communards where they killed, I think it was 147, they put up against the wall and shot. That is, by the way, a very interesting place. I, I, every time I go to Paris, I always schedule um, a couple of hours to go out there and just sit and talk to the people who come from all over the world to uh, sort of visit the wall. It's not as though the commune is is forgotten uh, by any sense, but there are accounts of, of them killing people in that neighborhood and uh, putting them in trench graves of, by the hundreds, right? So we're going to this wall where they killed 147 there, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, um, probably under the streets and houses in that neighborhood. And of course, then they also burned the bodies. Um, they were setting up fires to burn bodies. Um, so Mark, right, did, oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. About the, the other communes, you didn't say much. Oh, uh, yes. I, I write about them in the book because they were um, very important in their own way. Every one of the other communes is crushed by the French government. Uh, no case where the Germans uh, involved in it. One of the things that leads to that commune um, is that the French authorities are not doing a good enough job to protect these cities, is how they're viewing it. If you are looking at uh, Lyon, for example, Lyon is, uh, is on the Rhone. It's basically right down the river from where the, the, the Germans are trying to capture uh, places like Belfort. Uh, on the border. So um, people in Lyon are worried about defending the city. They're raising troops and they're getting sent off somewhere else. So there's a real sentiment that they need to uh, protect themselves. So the commune um, develops there partly as a question of self-defense. And they establish a League of the South, Ligue du Midi, um, that involves a number of these cities in the South who are experiencing their own communes. The primary purpose is self-defense against the Germans. And as part of that, Lyon in particular, but also Marseille, they're raising troops and they're choosing to funnel them where they want to funnel them. So they're sending them up to Garibaldi um, in, uh, in Dole or uh, Autan. And um, as part of that sort of really radical military force uh, that that represents, they're making a choice about that. The problem is that the old imperial structure we have to remember this in terms of the commune. The communes want self-government. And in the old imperial structure, how who governs Paris or Lyon or Marseille is a prefect sent out from the central government. So it's like, 
I can't, I, I don't think we have any analogy to that here, maybe a U.S. Marshal or something um, that gets credentials from the central government. And they basically are going to run what happens in the community. And the smaller communities are going to have sub prefects. Um, so what they're trying to do in Lyon and Marseille is they are trying to achieve self-government, the commune self-government. They're also trying to do it without clashing with the central government over the prefect. And the prefects know that game very well, and they play it very well. Uh, so that um, it's easy for them to sort of force the resignation of a prefect. They do that. But then the central government is going to send a new prefect, right? So how do you get out from under that? There is, there is, there's a delegation that comes out from Paris, by the way, to contact these groups and to connect with them. And there is an attempt by these cities, even after the forces of order, let's say, have come back to power in these cities, there's an attempt by these cities to intervene towards the end of the commune and arbitrate a settlement that is not going to end in the massacre of the population. And they basically, nobody's paying attention to them in the government. Uh, Peter Fay, you're, you're, you're next. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> enjoyed your talk so far. That's great. Uh, what I was interested in, part of the reason I attended this was uh, a little bit selfish. I wanted to, for my own purpose, you know, look at what are the lessons that can be drawn from this. Obviously, you've spent years looking at this, and uh, myself as a um, as a Marxist, I want to know. I know, I know, of course, that you know what Marx concluded were some of the lessons, and I'm interested in what you you think, you know, about his. I think the quote he said that the uh, one thing, especially, is proved by the commune that the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. In other words, you know, kind of uh, portending his later remarks on dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, grabbing state powers, crushing the opposition, and uh, enforcing rule of the working class on, you know, that was one of the major lessons. So I'm wondering... You know, do you, what do you, what do you think? What can you tell us about that? And uh, what's your response? Well, Marx had the disadvantage of being in London when all this was going on in Paris. He toyed with the idea of trying to get into Paris, but God, that would have been something if he had actually done that. It would have, I'm sure, meant nothing in terms of the outcome. He believed that um, August Blanqui, uh, had, he, had he been in Paris, had he not been locked up, uh, which he was most of his life. He was he was free during the siege. When the uh, Second Empire fell, he was released from prison. He went back to Paris and immediately tried to stage an insurrection in late October and wound up back in the custody of the government. Um, Blanqui was a, a very interesting figure, very admirable figure in many ways. Uh, he realizes this question of power and when other people are talking, when Fourier is talking about the oceans turning to lemonade and that sort of thing, uh, Blanqui is uh, organizing the, uh, the homeless and dispossessed of the city into a military force. Um, they're basically living in, they, the saying was that he was living in the sewers. He wasn't really living in the sewers, but Paris has an extensive underground, right? It's, it's so extensive that the French resistance was using it in World War II and the Germans weren't able to find them. Um, so Blanqui would be under the streets, and this is a strange idea of what revolution means, right? <clears throat> so you set your clocks, everybody, pick up your gun, we meet at this square at three o'clock, and we'll turn over, we'll topple the government and take power. And Blanqui did that a lot, uh, right? In fact, this was one of the experiences in 1839 that led uh, to what became the Communist League. Those German artisans who were living in Paris who were um, interested in socialist ideas, uh, they actually start thinking about this in terms of a real power struggle because of their association with Blanqui. And Marx says that had Blanqui been around, it would have changed things. I'm sure that it wouldn't have. Um, no individual was going to change this dynamic. 
at all. Um, I can't imagine. I, th I would say the commune, I have no problems with the idea of viewing the commune as a uh, early ex experiment with the dictatorship of the proletariat. It kind of was, um, but it was a proletariat that had not functioned as a proletariat yet. It had not developed the sort of norms and mechanisms that allowed it to, to make collective democratic decisions that, that they could all get behind. So uh, Marx's eye, of course, was also perhaps more even focused on what was going on in Germany. Uh, the unification of Germany led to the development of a socialist movement on a national scale there. You had um, different for forces associated with the first international, mostly emigres, and then you had the followers of La Salle who were organizing within, within Germany itself. And they had these sort of rather strong local organizations. And within their particular German states, they exercised a lot of influence. Um, and Marx was looking for now with the unification of Germany, Germany has got more of an industrial proletariat involved in this than you have in France and that the German industrial proletariat was going to be able to organize itself and, uh, and show the way to build a mass socialist party. Um, that was an interesting, interesting ex expectation on his part. Of course, what happened was that the uh, power of the German state centered in the military enabled the, um, the Prussian dominated state there to just simply outlaw socialism. It was, um, you know, it was, it was like that for a very crucial period of time. Maybe that was actually good for the socialist movement to be underground like that and to organize under those conditions. Um, in effect, you had something like that happen here, of course. The socialists in the United States, in the wake of the um, uh, Franco-Prussian War and the implosion of the First International, you get the first socialist, social democratic working men's party in 1874, then the Working Men's Party comes out of that in 76, and the Socialistic Labor in 77. And these are, in places, serious organizations. There are probably about 12,000 members of the SLP in the late 1870s, and they were winning elections from Covington to Kentucky to New Haven, Connecticut, uh, St. Louis. They were doing quite well. And the way that the ruling class responded to that sort of key in Chicago, is that basically you would win an election and they would just say, ah, no, you don't get to take your seat. And yes, as a citizen, you would then have the right to sue the government about this. And you do. There was one, uh, I think it was Arndt Schmidt in Chicago who sued the uh, state of Illinois over this and um, they stalled. Well, we see that with how the courts work, though, don't we? Uh, they stalled and stalled and stalled, and then they finally said, yes, you have a right to take your seat. And they made that decision the day before his term was over. So you don't necessarily have it outlawed, but you basically outlaw it, its ability to take a seat in the government, right? So I don't know what would have, what, you know, what would have happened over the long run as, uh, as Marx was looking at that. You did have in the aftermath of this, uh, you had this great bizarre announcement that Karl Marx had died, I think, right after the commune. And it's uh, all the uh, newspapers across the world were printing his obituary. It's, he's sitting in London reading them. But um, he was, of course, preoccupied at the time with, with uh, his work on capital. Yeah. Never ending story, never ending book. Yeah, I think he was about to publish the French edition at that point. Yeah. Uh, David Worley, did you want to uh, bring up your point from the chat? Uh, well, just to summarize, uh, since, since I understand that the National Assembly in Versailles was certainly just as divided politically as the commune was. Um, what I have read is that the only reason they didn't, they proclaimed the republic, the only reason they proclaimed the republic is because the two monarchist factions could not agree on who should be the king. If, uh, when they restored the monarchy. So they, so finally tears threw up his hands and said, Oh, well, then it's going to be a republic. But, uh, I was wondering why there was, was there no way for the, for the 
uh, commune to appeal to that Republican element in Versailles, or was there no sympathy in that Republican element in Versailles for the commune? That's a good question. Um, we have to remember that Gambetta, his, his, he's holding power, the Republican faction in the National Assembly. They're holding power by the slimmest of margins, right? So Gambetta is very, Gambetta doesn't want to rock the boat. Let's put it that way. So when Garibaldi shows up, the first thing he says is, no, thank you, but no, go away, go back to Italy. <laughs> you know, we'll even send an escort with you, just get out of the country. But of course, the pressure from his own faction forces him to do things that he wouldn't ordinarily do. Gambetta um, is sending his personal friends to become prefect in places like Marseille and Lyon in an attempt to try to overturn the, the uh, uh, local communes there. Um, it's not as though the commune is making a decision not to participate in the French government. They want to participate in the French government, but they have been surrounded by the Germans for months and under siege. And even when the peace comes, um, we have to remember that the Germans still encircle about three quarters of Paris, um, even after the treaty, because the treaty says that they don't release their stranglehold on the city until the French pay, start paying reparations. So the French government is engaged, is very heavily engaged, preoccupied in trying to figure out how they're going to raise money and do that. Um, and that's, that is a whole different story in a sense. Um, but it means that the people who are going to be important in the French government are going to be the people who have the connections. And that tends to be the old imperial politicians. It's going to be the people like Thierry, you know? Um, so the other thing, of course, is with Paris in that position, it's not able to participate in the national government, right? This is, um, this suits the national government, right? The National Assembly probably could not get to do a lot of what it did if Paris was adequately represented in it. And this continues even beyond the commune. Um, they, they had a strange system, you know, in the French National Assembly, you could, districts would elect you. And you didn't actually have to be from that district or anything. They were electing people who they thought would speak for them best in the National Assembly. So um, you have people like Thiers or Gambetta uh, representing multiple districts in the National Assembly. Um, but... When the war is over, one of the things they agreed when the war ended, well, it's in the, written into the peace terms, is that not only are they going to cede uh, Alsace and Lorraine, and they are also going to um, make the reparations, pay a whopping amount of money uh, to the Germans in reparation, but they have also agreed that the French troops in the east of France are not allowed to surrender. The, uh, the last French campaign was that it was a very ill-advised, but it, the sort of crap that these imperial generals come up with, you know. Um, they decided that they would um, make this last drive in to uh, release the, the besieged force at Belfort, uh, do a triple somersault over all the Germans, and, uh, and free Paris as a result. And, of course, what happened in that last one, Bourbaki. Uh, Charles Borbicki, um, fellow from another, another one of those, uh, descendants of a foreign officer who had worked in the French army. It was, it was Greek in his background. Borbicki led this force. He, he was also involved, by the way, in that early attempt to get the monarchy back on the throne rather than have a republic. So they put him in charge of the army and he basically got knocked back into Switzerland. And his force was just absolutely devastated. And the Germans wanted to make sure that there was no question about this, that they had beaten the French militarily. So they wanted to be able to defeat Borbicki, even though the French wanted to surrender. They wanted to get Garibaldi's force, seize them. Uh, Bismarck fantasized about marching Garibaldi in chains through the streets of Berlin with a sign on him saying, this is Italian gratitude, right? <laughs> um, but... In the end, um, the, uh, the 
the French government didn't want Paris involved. The National Assembly did not want Paris involved. Um, and when they elect representatives after this is all over, they're going to elect uh, Garibaldi. They're going to elect Victor Hugo, right? So Garibaldi goes to the National Assembly, and all he wants to do is to say, don't forget my soldiers. Don't forget the people who fought for you, um, who you left hanging in all of this. And he gets the floor, and uh, Thierry and the rest of them boo him and shout him down so that he can't speak to the National Assembly, right? That's a remarkable uh, event, huh? But they just don't want Paris involved in these deliberations at all. Okay, does anyone else have a, a question or comment for uh, for Mark or for the group uh, on these topics? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll express our great gratitude to Mark for this uh, really fascinating discussion and uh, contribution to our knowledge of the Paris Commune, which is always uh, Always something fresh and new to uh, to learn about. It's such a rich uh, body of experience. Uh, so stay tuned for future MEP events at uh, marksheadproject.org. And uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. okay, thanks, Mark. Bye, all.